category number eight, where people told us that they wish they knew or they had some insight on this. Uh, one personal statement captures this next sentiment. Really, the area was an area of parenting. Now, before I read the statement, I, let me say this. I, I know a lot of you guys are going to hear this and think to yourself, seriously, parenting already? I, like, I'm still trying to find myself a wife, all right? Hear me out on this. I think this will be very relevant. This individual wrote and said, I wish I knew that having children would require a major adjustment in our marriage. I think when a lot of us are dating, um, we usually can't see beyond the honeymoon night. Right? Because it's great. Love, we love each other, and we might someday dream about the future, but we don't really have realistic pictures of what that future might look like. Now, my wife and I are just entering into this parenting stage, so you know, I, I got like five weeks of wisdom that I can give you, which in real terms means nothing. Um, so I'm actually going to defer to experienced sources for some insight on parenting. And the bulk of the information I'm going to share with you now actually comes from a book called The Couple Checkup by Dr. David Olson, um, Amy Olson, and Peter Larson, phenomenal book. But in one of their chapters on parenting, listen to what it says, and we'll start working from this point. They say, parenting is a responsibility like no other, for you are proactively engaged in the single most important thing you can do for your children, which is to model the importance of your relationship with your spouse. Studies have shown that a harmonious marriage relationship promotes competence and maturity in children. Every bit of energy you put into supporting each other lovingly and respectfully will come back to you through your children. Whether you realize it or not, children are always observing and taking into consideration observing your relationship with your spouse. Their interaction or interpretation of how their parents interact with one another serves as a model for how they inter interact with others, of course. They will experience or learn experientially through their own relationships, but the parental dyad is a powerful template for the behaviors that will feel natural to them. Now, here's what all of that means in remix English. Um, here's what it means. It means that whatever you are right now, emotionally, spiritually, uh, whatever you are right now as a single person will get magnified when you get married. But when kids enter into the picture, it explodes. Let me say that again. Whatever you are right now as a single, spiritually, emotionally, whatever you are right now when you get married will get magnified. But when you get, or when kids begin to enter into the picture, It'll explode. Now, that can be a good thing if you have a harmonious marriage. It can end up having, you can end up having balanced, healthy, godly kids. But if you are in a devitalized or perhaps dysfunctional relationship, or perhaps you yourself have some unresolved issues that you take in marriage, you stand the risk of raising some very troubled, unbalanced children. So you see, even as a single, your attitude right now and the way you interact with wherever you're going to end up dating potentially has an impact on your kids. So it, it starts when? Now. You know, in our five weeks of experience as parents, my wife and I have been blessed with our little boy, Nathaniel, um, especially in those few hours during the day when the little man is actually alert. I mean, he sleeps, poops, and eats like, you know, 24 hour, uh, 23 hours a day. In like an hour, he gives us alert time. And he's a lot of fun, and we love him. But I got to tell you, my wife and I are learning pretty quickly that if her and I are not careful about managing our time or intentional about carving out time for ourselves, that little dude is trying to be king and emperor of our lives. He's trying to rule us. And he's going to get all the little five-week old babies in the community and try to control our lives. Like, that's his plan. I know he has a plan. And, and, and you'll find out pretty quickly, and many couples who have been married longer than my wife and I have will tell you that the time and the energy necessary to parent often draws away from a couple's private time and energy. You might have seen a commercial that illustrates this. It was a while back. I don't remember what they were trying to sell. Uh, but it's, in, in the camera, it starts with a camera shot opens up with a couple at a dinner table. The scene is romantic. The light is low, and you can hear the soothing bass voice of Barry White in the background. Romantic scene. 
The couple, obviously in love, are staring deeply in each other's eyes, and they're leaning in for a kiss, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a spoonful of spaghetti lands on the guy's face. The camera pans out, the music stops abruptly, and we discover they're actually at a dinner table with their two toddlers. One is wailing loudly as if someone just kidnapped his pacifier, and the other is playing with his food and thinks it looks better on Dad's face. Now, when I saw that commercial a few years ago, I remember thinking, well, that's hilarious. Now I see it, I'm like, yeah, it's so hard. I can identify with it, right? So, the truth is this. Having kids, which will eventually happen for many of you, can truly be in a, in a life-enriching experience, and it, it, it can really deepen uh, a couple's connection in marriage, but you need to have some idea of what to expect before you start expecting. You with me so far? Bill Cosby's character, Dr. Huxtable, in The Cosby Show said this. He said, my wife and I have grown so much closer together, but mostly because we were afraid of the children. And you will come close to that on some occasions. I realize that most of you guys are terrified now. I just, like, all of them are like, really? Kids are that terrible? You're evil. Oh, they're not. All right. Now, I know some of you are single, right? You're thinking to yourself, okay, this doesn't really apply to me. I mean, I haven't even met the one yet. I shouldn't even be thinking about this stuff. And you know what? That very well could be true. But here's what I found for a lot of single people, because I was once single. Truth is that you will find that meeting the one, whoever they are, will come a lot sooner than you think. I know it can feel like years waiting, but it'll happen sooner than you think. And when it does, you will want to know what I'm about to say so you can have that conversation with your partner before you say, I do. And one of the important discussions you will want to have with the person you end up saying I do to is really to discuss what, or to discuss the role that you see each other or see yourselves playing in marriage when you eventually have a child because it'll help you identify your parenting style. Once again, a lot of this you're going to learn when you actually do have kids, but you can have this discussion way in advance. You know, one of the responses that we received among the many um, about the pre-marriage, pre-children discussion was this. One person wrote this. She said, or he said, I wish my spouse and I had discussed and agreed on the same values on how to raise our children before we got married. Especially on issues like, for this person, homeschooling versus private school or public school. Once again, those are things that you never think about. You just figure, oh, they're going to go to school. Well, if one person was raised in a home where they were all homeschooled and the other person was raised in public school and you both don't agree with that, well, that can kind of create some tension. So, you know what I'm saying? And so this conversation is something very simple you can have. It's important because it'll help you, in having that conversation, um, it'll help you identify how you were raised. Because believe it or not, the way you're going to raise your children has been influenced, without you knowing it, by the way you were raised by your parents. Some of you were raised in families where dad was had hardly ever involved, mom was boss and she ran the show. Some of you might have grown up in an authoritarian household where dad was king and mom was the messiah, the savior. Others grew up in single parent homes and perhaps don't even have a paradigm of what raising healthy kids look like. And some of you guys grew up with the Brady Bunch where smiles and laughs were the deal, right? We've all been raised in different homes. And I'm not naive enough to think that I can help you solve all your problems before you get married and have kids. But I can give you some counsel on the kinds of conversations that you need to have once you start dating to help you prepare and make sure that you're actually entering into a relationship with someone who shares the same value about raising a family. And you know, I would go as far as to say, you know, if your values on raising kids don't agree, that's a deal breaker. So here's some questions to, the, to discuss. And I got these questions from the book I quoted from early on. Um, here's some questions to discuss. And you're gonna talk about this in your small rooms, but let me just go over them really quickly. So here's a question. How will you discuss this with your potential date or spouse or husband, whatever? How were you parented as a child and a teenager? Did your mom and dad use the same parenting style? What are or were your reactions to your parents' style of Parenting, did it seem fair? Was it 
effective. And, and the reason why these discussions are good is because oftentimes if you're raised in one style, sometimes if you didn't particularly enjoy it, you might tend to overreact and go to the other extreme. So if you were raised in an authoritarian home, you might end up saying, I don't like the way my parents raised me, so I'm going to be permissive or over permissive. Or you go to that extreme and you become really authoritarian. But if you have this discussion, you might begin to get some sense of if you share the same value. Um, you talk about questions like, what style feels most natural to you as a parent? Would you like to use this style? And, and which, which couple in your life, which married couple or families do you look up to as, man, I love the way they're raising your children, and, and hold them up as a model? Now, as you consider those questions, which once again, you're going to have a chance to discuss in your small groups, um, let me share with you um, four, or maybe, yeah, four parenting styles, just to once again kind of help you think about how you were raised in your home, and potentially how that might have influenced or affected how you're going to raise your children. So let's talk about a few parenting styles. There's, first of all, the balanced parenting style. And in the balanced parenting style, this is an ideal method of raising your children. With this style, parents have established rules and expectations that are discussed with the children. Now, the parent is always boss and is always in charge, but they are willing to acknowledge the child's perspective while at the same time using reason and power to enforce their standards. That's why it's balanced. And this style of parenting, according to the experts, will usually result in having kids that are energetic, friendly, self-reliant, cheerful, and achievement-oriented. Hence, a balanced parenting style. There's the authoritarian parenting style, of which many of us have probably seen some picture of. This is where the parents have rigid rules and expectations and strictly enforce them. Dad or mom is king, or both are, and it's essentially a dictatorship living in that home, right? Unfortunately, being raised in an environment like that often ends up turning teens into rebels. And this can sometimes result in having kids that are unfriendly, moody, irritable, unhappy, perhaps even unstable. There's the permissive parenting style. This is where the child is allowed to be boss. Rarely do parents make a child conform to their standards, which ends up being problematic for the child later on in life. Children of permissive parents will often exhibit impulsive, aggressive behavior, and they will tend to be domineering, and at the same time, somehow low achievers. And then lastly, there's the uninvolved parenting style. By the way, these aren't getting any better, okay? There's the uninvolved parenting style, and this is self-explanatory, but this refers to a parent who often ignores their children's behavior and lets them get away with anything until it affects them or until it affects the parent's schedule or activities. And this results in children who are loners, withdrawn. Now, this is not a perfect list. I'm pretty sure there's all kinds of different parenting styles out there or, or some sort of hybrid of these different styles. My goal is not to cover every single parenting style that's out there, but to help you understand what kind of parenting household you were raised in, how it has, listen to this, how it has shaped you as an adult. I've come across a number of 20-somethings who honestly are still 16 emotionally. I've come across a, long, a number of 30-year-olds, 30 30-something-year-olds 30 who are still 12 emotionally. And they're stuck at 12 because there were certain experiences that they had at home with their family that they never left. And so they're growing physically, but emotionally they're stuck. And so part of resolving that is understanding from whence you came. Right? Understanding how you were raised in your home. So that ultimately, you're healthy enough not only to find another healthy partner, but to raise up, hopefully, healthy, emotionally healthy children. When you do have a chance, or when you get to your discussion groups later on this evening, you'll get a chance to discuss those questions. But here's some very practical lessons you can even talk away right now. When you do have kids, just a couple things to put in mind. Uh, think in terms of, or you say you have this discussion with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, think of raising them in terms of, uh, or think of raising them as a team, really is what I'm getting at. Raising them up as a team, a husband and wife team. Kids are very 
clever, and even at a very young age, they find out pretty quickly that they can pit mom against dad if they don't get what they want. Or pit dad against mom if they don't get what they want. Don't fall for it, remember, they're in the enemy. My wife and I have an older couple um, who's mentoring us. Um, one of the things we did as soon as we got married is that Grace Church here offers a class for young married couples. By the way, the leaders of that class are here today. That's Brian and Shirley. Can you guys raise your hands? Brian and Shirley, yeah, they're a phenomenal couple. Sunday mornings here at Grace, starting in the fall, um, they host a Sunday morning class for newlywed couples where uh, they basically walk you through the things you should kind of be going through. And there was like eight couples there. And I got to tell you, that class, I believe, really helps my wife and I start off right because we're in the class and we're finding out that, oh, other new couples are going through this, so we're not that weird, all right? Phenomenal class, but when that time comes, they're your connection. But anyway, one of the couples that they assigned to us who's mentoring us tells us a story about how one of his little girls actually ended up um, playing hit against his wife. I gotta read this to you because I think it was so great. I have to write it down. He says they had gone to the grocery store and his little girl had desperately pleaded with his wife for a particular kind of cookie. And mom had said no and reiterated it to her husband that under no circumstance did she to get this cookie. Of course, no to a child means ask dad when mom's not looking. And so as soon as the mom walks away, she goes up to her father, picks up the box of cookies she was told not to get, and gets a box of juice, and goes to her father and asks if she can get both. Dad says, no, you can only have one. So she puts down the box of juice, and takes the box of cookies that she was told not to get, goes to the counter, and pays for it, or gets dad to pay for it. Naturally, mom comes over and sees her with a box of cookies she was told not to get, and is incredulous, and is yelling at her husband, and he cannot figure out how he just got outsmarted by the seven-year-old. Remember, they're the enemy, right? And, and I told that story really to make the point that think in terms of raising your children as a, as a team. Be consistent, be cooperative as parenting team when the time comes. When you both agree on and establish a rule, both of you should consistently enforce it because it sends a strong message that mom and dad are in charge. The second very practical counsel you should have before you get married with the person you're dating is this, um, or thing you can implement, is never undermine your spouse by critiquing or ridiculing them in the presence of the children. Never insult, and I don't insult your spouse at all, but especially not in the presence of the children. Because if you do that, you'll end up giving your children permission to do the same thing to your spouse. You'll also end up setting up a model for your children as to how they treat men and women in the future. Men and women who grow up and abuse their spouses didn't just learn that overnight, they learned it somewhere. And though the media and personal life experience plays a huge role in how one acts, the first learning, learning environment where a child picks up tips on how to treat their spouse is the home. And you know what? Uh, uh, the way you treat your spouse doesn't start when you get married, it starts when you're dating. And once again, I, I want you, I know parenting is much further down the line, but a lot of skills you're gonna be using that starts now. A lot of ways you're gonna be treating each other in your marriage starts now, and, and hence why I think this is important for you to grasp. So don't do or say to your spouse what you would never want your child to do to their future spouse or would ever want your mom to say or do to your dad and really vice versa. Now I could go on and on about parenting, but you know what, we're five weeks old, so I'll come back to you in five years time and have this discussion again. Hopefully you guys have graduated at the time. So that was the ninth area that we received a response on what people wish they knew about marriage. The final area, um, the tenth and final area we discovered people had, or most people wish they had insights on before they said I do, uh, was not really something that was explicitly written out. In fact, this uh, final category found me, instead of me coming up with it, and, and you get what I'm saying in a second here, but um, it's in the area of abuse and domestic violence in a marriage. And I gotta tell you, you know, comparing to this, this was not what I was looking for, but as I worked on it, um, well, let me read what the person wrote down that really triggered this thought. The person wrote down this, she said, or he said, I wish I had paid more attention to the red flags that I saw in my spouse when we were dating. The implication being, 
they didn't pay attention to the red flags and got married anyway and then started to regret that decision. Now, I don't know if this person writing this is necessarily referring to domestic abuse or is simply referring to some bad habits that their spouse has, but man, I felt compelled by the Holy Spirit to go in this direction and really dedicate this last part of this message to the issue of domestic violence in marriage. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, I, I think you and I would agree, and I think it's safe to say that no one ever enters into marriage with the intention of being abused by their spouse, right? Yet, the United States Surgeon General writes this, that domestic violence is the leading cause of injury to women ages 15 and 44, more common than automobile accidents, muggings, and cancer death combined. Something's wrong somewhere. I mean, many a spouse might say that they were not aware that their spouse was like this while they were dating, or that the behavior is something recent that they found. But here's the reality. Truth be told, abusive behavior will usually start in an individual long before they enter into marriage. But it's just that it shows up in very subtle ways when they're dating. It's there. It's just very subtle during the dating stage. And unfortunately, those red flags that really should perk your attention up are overlooked because they're in love. Or they can do no wrong. When in reality, God's probably giving you a way up, say, pay attention to those red flags. And those red flags could be statements that your friends are making saying, look, there's something about this dude or about this girl. Or you're sensing that. But you, but you, at least I'm dating someone. Or in love. Which, honestly, the more I think about it, maybe I'm becoming cynic. But I think it's more like being insane. Because I think when you talk about being in love, you're not thinking properly. Because you're overlooking some clear things and you're just like, I'm so kind of because I was there. Before I met my wife, I was in some very unhealthy, well, a unhealthy relationship. Until God had to smack me upside the head. You know, and I think it's very ridiculous when people get in abusive relationships and stay in it. Now, I'm not talking about marriage, I'm not talking about this dating stage. I mean, it's ridiculous because if someone is rude to you, if someone mistreats you or ever gets physical with you while you're dating, then what makes you think that all that is going to disappear overnight when you get married and move into the same house where they have easier access to you? You just compounded the problem by getting married to them. So for clarity's sake, let me define domestic abuse. It is a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship that is used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over another intimate partner. That's the general definition of abuse. Now, um, and by the way, when I'm speaking about abuse, I, I, I know most of us will think, men abusing women, and, and it's the larger percentage of it is that. But also, as a guy, I mean, there are situations where guys have been abused by their wives. But here's what I'm getting at. When we speak of domestic violence, I think most of us think of physical abuse. Because that's what's most visible to us. But the reality is that abuse will show up in various subtle forms before it becomes full-blown physical violence. So, domestic abuse, listen to this, can not only be physical, but it can also be emotional. Domestic abuse can be verbal. Domestic abuse can be financial, economical, sexual, or even spiritual. And you need to be attentive to all these subtle signs. These are a lot of details that I know a lot of you guys want to write down. During the week, on our website, remixnj.com, we usually have every single sermon there in print. You can type it out, look at it, or just look it up and get it for yourself in case you can't write everything down now. But let me walk through each one of those different abuses. So once again, I just want you to be aware of them, okay? Because a lot of you are going to start dating, a lot of you are going to get married really soon. But here it is. Emotional abuse is um, any behavior that is designed to control and subdue another human being through the use of fear, humiliation, intimidation, guilt, coercion, or manipulation. And what makes emotional abuse very dangerous or just as dangerous as physical abuse, is that it is a subtle, systematic wearing down of a, of a victim's self-confidence and 
self-worth and really trust in your own perception. It's very subtle. But it's really a wearing down to the point that you kind of lose yourself. You'll see emotional abuse displayed in people who have a tendency to constantly berate others or belittle people under the guise that all the other pretense that they're trying to give you advice or trying to teach you. In reality, what they're doing is starving you of affection so that you continually come to them to get a refill, an emotional refill. Very manipulative. Verbal abuse is not too far off from emotional abuse. It's all of that, but with actual spoken insults. Some common signs to watch out for in someone who, who's uh, verbally abusive is uh, someone who constantly calls you derogatory names or continually uses sarcasm to put you down, especially in the presence of others. Watch out for that. Yelling, swear, swearing, or screaming threats to intimidate are also signs of verbal abuse. Economic abuse is basically an intentional withholding of money from one's partner or the means to make money. And I've seen this on a number of occasions and where men prevent their spouse from getting or keeping a job, forcing her to have to ask him for money, or in some extreme situations, taking her money out of the bank and denying her access to the family account. Sexual abuse is exactly what it sounds like. It can be as subtle as holding back sex from one's partner as a form of punishment. And in some extreme cases, exerting physical force on a reluctant partner during sex, which really is rape. Spiritual abuse is a blend of everything I just talked about. The major difference is that the person doing all these things, or these manipulative behaviors, is justifying it by quoting scripture, which in my mind is the worst kind of abuse. So they'll do and say things to their spouse and family members and say, well, the Bible says you have to obey me and respect me. Now, those are very subtle. They're not physical, right? And it's very easy for us to say, well, that's not abuse. And, 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 and really, I'm talking about a frequency here, right? So, let me give you some how-to-know tips. If you're dating someone and suspect that they might be abusive, or perhaps you know somebody close to you and you suspect that they might be abusive in any way, shape, or form, here are some really quick red flags that you should watch out for, especially if it's a frequent habit. I'm defining frequent as more than once. So here are some things to identify if you are in an abusive relationship. Here, here it is. Do they, or this individual, do they get excessively jealous or possessive? It's a red flag. Do they tell you or insist how you should look or dress? Do they respect your personal space and understand you need to get away from the phone and computer? Do they require you to always have your phone on you so they can reach you? Do they treat you so badly that you're embarrassed for your friends or family to see? Do they threaten to leave you or hurt themselves if you don't do certain things? Do they withhold affection from you whenever they don't get what they want? Do they constantly put down your ideas, your hopes, and your dreams? Oh, here's one. Are they really nice sometimes and then really mean at other times, almost like they have two different personalities? Red flag. And this last one might seem obvious, but some people need to be reminded. If they ever push you, shove you, grab you, punch you, hold you, and kick you, yeah, get out of that. I mean, if you answered yes to any of these, Right? I'm defining frequent as more than once. If you answer yes to any one of these, please hear me clearly on this. Get the hell out of that relationship. Otherwise, you literally will end up in their hell. Do whatever you need to do to end that relationship right away because it's going to get worse if you end up getting locked down in a marriage with them. By the way, if the person you're dating never does any of those things we just talked about, they never do it to you, but you see them doing it to other people? Red flag. Because it's only a matter of time before they turn your attention on you. Be smart. Don't begin something that you will spend the rest of your life regretting. Now, 
let's say you don't pay attention to my advice. And you do end up getting married to someone who's abusive. And, and you know what? That's a very real situation. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. And you're in an abusive relationship. And when the time comes, you know what? I understand the struggle between wanting to get a divorce right away, but also wanting to honor the words of Scripture where, Jesus, where God says, I hate divorce. Right? Malachi 2.16, God says, I hate divorce. In fact, the only time a divorce is permitted in a marriage, scripturally speaking, is when there's been adultery or abandonment. And you know what? That's very hard because if you're in an abusive relationship and things are not going well, but yet you want to divorce, but you're struggling because as a believer you want to honor God. Um, so let me say this. In that same passage in Malachi where it says God hates divorce, the verse right after that also says this. That God hates a man who covers himself with violence, just as he would his garment. Proverbs 11.29 says, He who brings trouble on his family will inherit the wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise. Psalm 11.5 says, The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, and those who love violence, his soul hates. So make no mistake about it. God is wholly opposed to violence in marriage. There are a few things that Scripture says God hates, but He hates a violent spouse. It's a scary thought. And you know what? For every violent spouse, they will give an account for how they treated their spouse someday. But in the meantime, the question is, what's a woman to do or a man to do? So there's some very practical things you can do without going against Scripture, right? Once again, I'm speaking. If you end up Making a series of wrong choices and you end up in a marriage, or you know someone who's there. Here's some very practical things. Actually, before I even share that, let me share with you some resources that would come in really handy as you kind of think through what to do next. Uh, the first one I want to share with you is actually a website. It's an online interactive educational training website called the Rave Project dot org. Um, once again, this information will be available by Tuesday on the website, the entire sermon printed out. Um, but RAVE is an initiative that seeks, seeks to bring knowledge and social action together to assist families of faith impacted by abuse, and it stands for religion and violence e-learning. Very practical, interactive things you can reference people to or go to yourself and check it out. Uh, the second resource I want to share with you is really to meet with one of our uh, um, ministry leaders here at Grace Church, Dr. Sherry McDonald. She's the director of children's ministry. She works here at the church. She's done some uh, amazing work with the women's ministry here. Not only that, her doctoral dissertation was actually about abuse. And it's actually her dissertation that I used as a source for a lot of what I'm sharing with you. But she's phenomenal, has such a lovely heart. And um, if that's your situation or you know someone in it, ladies, she would love to sit with you and talk with you um, through that. And if you're a guy, meet with me and we'll work something out. And so you can call the church at any time. Um, check our website to establish or get some kind of contact with her and set up an appointment. Once again, should that day come, that's some, those are some resources you can turn to. Now, so those are sort of some resources you can turn to. So let me say this. Though I personally land on the side of the scriptures that encourage couples not to get a divorce, I am strongly in favor of, when there is abuse in a marriage, I am strongly in favor of an intentional time of separation. If there's any kind of non-physical or even physical abuse going on, like, like an intentional time of separation is different from a divorce. It's you taking yourself out of that environment to get some perspective. And by, I, by, that, by that, I mean if you're being so abused in your marriage that's starting to have significant psychological effects on you, then I believe the scripture gives you allowance to move out of the house with your kids, if need be, for a season until your spouse can get some sort of professional counseling or both of you get some kind of professional counseling where you're willing and intentionally working through this problem. A time of separation, once again, is different from a divorce. And that time span is dependent on how long... Marriage is willing to be worked out. On the other hand, if you find yourself in a marriage where you're being physically abused 
and your life is constantly in danger and your spouse is unwilling or not showing any signs of wanting to change, I gotta be honest, at this stage in my ministry experience and theological understanding, I would argue that the preservation of human life takes precedence at this point and you should seek a divorce. My opinion, I might disagree with me. But understand, I'm putting preservation of human life as a precedence. If there's constant threat to your life and there's no desire to change. Now, my view might change in a number of years, but for now, that's where I land on a Christian's response to domestic violence. I'm talking about where you've been, and I've seen this situation with families where there's been separation and the husband is still threatening and there needs to be some kind of intentional disengagement from that. Now, my heart's desire and my hope for you is that you don't have to do all of that, right? My hope for you is that you would just pay more attention now, and that way I don't have to wrestle with a theological issue when the issue comes up. I don't want to have to make that decision or give you that counsel. I would rather you not be stupid now, excuse me. Make the right decisions now. Pay attention to the red flags. I can't tell you how many marriages in recent years I've just seen people, oh, I met this person who are in love, and you get married, and I'm like, ee, ee, ee. like there are flags popping up all over the place, but no, I'm in love. And I'm like, yeah, but. So be smart. And don't let that be your story. Okay. So we've talked about what not to do. I mean, you some very practical tips on what to look for, or what I like to call um, go flags, green flags, as opposed to red flags. Um, and, and you know, when you think about a spouse, right, I mean, so we've just covered all the 10 things people wish they knew, top 10 things people wish they knew, all right? So let, let me give you some really things to look for. And, and in order to do that, I think you gotta, pick, when you think about the kind of person you wanna marry, you gotta think long term, you gotta begin with the end in mind. You gotta picture in your mind's eye the kind of home you wanna have. Not talking about where, you know, big house or small house, just I mean, the kind of environment you wanna raise your child in, right? You gotta start with that because that gives you some idea of the kind of person you wanna be with. Picture a home where the words of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 is lived out, where it says, Be completely humble and gentle and patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep unity spirit through the bond of peace. Picture a living room, a kitchen, a bedroom, and a garage where Proverbs 24, 3 is true, where by wisdom a house is built and through understanding it is established and through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. So here's some very practical things to look for, what I call green flags. Look for someone who accepts you as you are and looks out for your best interests. Look for someone who holds your secrets in confidentiality and on the same token doesn't spill, spill every little intimate thought they have all over Facebook. Look for someone who encourages personal growth not only in your life but also in theirs. Look for someone who affirms your talent and ability and enjoys seeing you excel, watching you excel. Look for someone who easily forgives and communicates openly. Look for someone who takes ownership of their own faults and responsibilities. Somebody who doesn't blame others for their stuff. Look for someone who can disagree with you without being judgmental or condemning. And lastly, but by no means the least, look for someone who's a student of Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you to look for a Christian. Don't look for someone who's saying, I'm, that. I'm not asking you to look for someone who's wearing the label Christian. I'm asking you to look for a student of Jesus Christ. Someone who displays biblical character qualities that reflect a learner's heart. That's different from learning the tag Christian. By the way, those are all traits you should be developing in your life anyway, right? Because what's going to happen? You're going to attract what you put out. You put unhealthy, dysfunctional junk out, you're going to attract that. But you put these kind of qualities out, and those who possess them will be drawn to you like I confess, none of this is easy. It takes work. You ask any married couple who's been married longer than a minute, they'll tell you that marriage takes work. It's rewarding and it's joyful, but it takes work. And I realize that this series has been hard on some of you. The last time we did a series at Remix, I remember um, after a series of relationships, like a ton of people went to go get married. And I thought, yeah, no, we gotta fix that. <laughs> so I decided to go the other extreme of the series, like let me tell you what really happens in marriage. 
And my prayer is that God would keep each and every one of you and lead you as you seek out a mate to spend the rest of your life with. Let's pray. Let's keep the video up for the next thing up, Alicia. Father, I uh, thank you so much for this chance to work through these lists, this list of the top 10 things people wish they knew before they said, I do. God, I pray that you would prepare each heart for the marriage. I, I, I pray, Lord, that even during the stages, they're single, that you would be molding them and shaping them and building in them the character qualities that would be an amazing gift to your future spouse. Areas in their lives right now that are problematic, the wounds in their lives, emotional wounds that have shaped who they are as adults, I pray that you would bring healing and restoration for those who feel there have been locked under bondage, that they would experience freedom in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would lead each person into healthy, healthy, godly relationships. I pray for those who are preparing to go back to school. The Lord, while they're on campus, you would keep them focused on you. Help them not fall in with the crowd, but help them stand out for the kingdom. I pray that those who are waiting and feel lonely, that you would be their mighty comfort. You grant them comfort and community, Lord, wherever they might be, in times of loneliness. Jesus, I pray that truly from this ministry and this church, we would truly raise up generations of families who love Jesus, who go the distance, families that build to last. And I ask that you can do all of these things in the matchless, mighty name of Jesus Christ.